Welcome back. In the last lecture, we covered some basics of legal procedure that are particularly important in surveillance cases. This lecture addresses the actual legal texts that we'll be working with in the course. In the first part of the lecture, we'll discuss statutes. As you hopefully recall from earlier, these are simply legislative enactments. We'll talk about some of the common statute citation styles, and I'll give a couple tips that I've found helpful when reading statutes. The second part of the lecture covers court opinions, the written documents issued by courts that explain rulings. Once again, we'll look at common citation styles, and I'll make some suggestions for how you might approach the reading. Let's begin with statute citation styles. Here's a statute that you may have read about in the news, Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act. This provision of federal law is the legal basis for the National Security Agency's Domestic Telephone Metadata Surveillance Program. Later in the course, we will talk about that program in some detail. This statutory citation has two straightforward components. It includes a reference to a particular legislative enactment, which is the Patriot Act. It also includes a reference to a specific part of that enactment, namely Section 215. Let's look at another statutory citation, Section 501 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. You might be inclined to read it just like the previous citation. You might think this is a reference to the FISA legislation, which was enacted in 1978. And you might think this is a reference to a specific part of that enactment. Here's the catch. FISA didn't originally have a Section 501. Section 501 of FISA is, in fact, the same as Section 215 of the Patriot Act. The key point is that the reference to FISA here isn't because we're talking about FISA as enacted, but rather because we're talking about FISA as amended. The notion is that FISA is an evolving collection of related statutes. The Patriot Act swapped in language that acts as Section 501 of that collection. Alright, one final statute citation to consider. Once again, it is functionally the same as Section 215 of the Patriot Act and Section 501 of FISA. Here is the difference. When a legislature enacts a statute, the text of that statute gets edited and integrated into a uniform, codified compilation of statutes. This is a tiny part of a compilation in printed form. The previous citations referenced specific legislative enactments. The citation here, by contrast, references a compilation of statutes. For clarity, let's separate the components. The reference to USC in the middle tells us which statutory compilation this is. It's the United States Code, which contains federal statutes. The 50, on the left, tells us which title of the compilation we're looking at. Title 50 happens to deal with national security. Going back to the right, there's this squiggly S thing. That's just a simple symbol that means section. Finally, on the far right is the number 1861. That's the specific section number. So, putting it all together, this is Title 50, Section 1861, of the United States Code. Alright, that wraps statutory citations. Now a couple quick tips for reading statutes. First, you should always check for provided definitions. Statutes often include terms that are expressly defined, and the definition can have tremendous implications. We will see, for example, how just by nitpicking a definition, Federal investigators were sometimes able to read opened email without getting a warrant. The second suggestion I would make is to check related statutes, and especially neighboring statutes. Very often a specific provision makes more sense when it's read as part of an overall statutory scheme or as a parallel to other statutes. In our discussion of intelligence surveillance, we will see some striking ways 
in which foreign intelligence statutes have been read in a very different way from parallel law enforcement statutes. Okay, that's it for statutes. Now, on to court opinions. When a court reaches a decision on a set of important issues, it will often produce a written opinion. These documents can be quite lengthy and intricate, and they often play a key role in subsequent judicial opinions and policy making. Let's take a look at how court opinions might be cited. Here's an example from December of last year. In this opinion, Judge Richard Leon concluded that the National Security Agency's Domestic Bulk Telephone Metadata Program was likely unconstitutional. For clarity, let's pull apart the components of this citation. Claimant against Obama, or Claimant v. Obama, is just the name of the case. It briefly tells us something about the parties. Here, the last name of the lead-off plaintiff is Claimant, and the first defendant is the president. The fuller version of the case name is called a caption, and you might see that on court filings. In some citations, you will see the U.S. listed as a party that started litigation. United States against Davis, for example, is a cell phone tracking case that we will encounter later. When the U.S. is the lead-off party, that's a very good indication that you're looking at a citation to a criminal case. Some of the citations you will see in the course are more descriptive, such as the slickly named In Re Application of the United States of America for Historical Cell Site Data. In surveillance law, citations of that form tend to come from ex parte proceedings. Remember that those proceedings start with just one party, so there isn't formally a defendant to name. Now let's turn to 957 F sub second 1. That's a reporter citation. Much like statutes, court opinions can be edited and compiled. A case reporter is simply a compilation of opinions. The first part of the reporter citation, 957, is simply a volume number. The second part, F sub second, tells us which case reporter series the opinion was published in. F sub second is just an abbreviation for the Federal Supplement Second Series, a case reporter that consists mostly of district court opinions. The last part of the reporter citation, 1, is simply the page that the opinion begins on. That's it for reporter citations. Finally, there's this little piece in parentheses. The first part, DDC, tells us the court that issued the opinion. It's an abbreviation for the oh-so-inconveniently named United States District Court for the District of Columbia. The second part, 2013, is just the year that the opinion was issued. All right, so there's a dissected case citation. Let's look at one more. This citation is to an opinion that was not published in a case reporter. The giveaway is that the citation references a court docket number, here 14-70655, instead of a reporter citation. It also gives a specific date, not just a year. Courts differ in their publishing practices. Some mark nearly all of their opinions for publication, while others are much more selective. Courts also differ in their treatment of unpublished opinions. Many give them the same weight as published opinions, but some give them lesser consideration. All right, enough about case citations. The last topic for this lecture is reading court opinions. One of the better analogies that I've heard is that learning law is like learning music. It takes a lot of practice, and it requires developing a totally new set of intuitions. So don't be surprised if understanding part of a judicial opinion takes a few reads, and definitely don't be afraid to ask for some guidance. With that said, let me offer a rubric that I find helpful when reading court opinions. First, I like to get a handle on the facts of a case. Who did what, and who's suing for what? Second, I check the posture of the case. What rulings have occurred so far? And, if this is an appeal, what was the lower court's view? 
Third, I try to identify the particular questions that the court is answering. Sometimes the court will just note which questions have been posed. Not always, though. Fourth, I look for the holdings of the case. A holding is, simply, how the court answers a question that was posed. Sometimes courts will express views on questions that have not been posed. That's called dicta, and while it can give important insights into the court's thinking, it can't be formally binding. The last component I try to spot is a court's reasoning, that is, how it arrived at each holding. A court's reasoning is especially important when the holding is ambiguous or narrow, since it suggests how to adjudicate similar issues in future cases. One critical part of a court's reasoning is how it treats other judicial opinions. Does it accept them, reject them, or creatively distinguish them in some way? All right, that brings to a close what I wanted to discuss about court opinions and about reading legal materials. In the next two lectures, we will discuss how surveillance practices can get litigated in the courts.